a good place to start is, is just talking about the eosinophil as a whole and, and really what is it. Well, it's a type of white blood cell, um, and it makes up in, in normal circumstances about uh, somewhere between 1 and 4 percent of the white blood cells that are just out in the regular blood circulation. Uh, it's named an eosinophil because it, it stains very strongly with a dye called eosin, and in Greek uh, for uh, loving is, is phil, so eosinophil means a, a uh, eosin-loving uh, cell, and uh, it has several functions. Uh, some that are fairly well defined, some that we still are working on our understanding of, but the ma two main areas where we recognize that it, uh, it has a role are in allergy and in uh, fighting off parasitic infections. So uh, you'll see on the left there a little schematic of a uh, eosinophil, and, and uh, the red staining uh, uh, from that eosin is because the there are numerous granules that kind of soak up that uh, particular stain, and you can see those are those red granules in this uh, kind of comic uh, uh, strip characterization of it. There's also a, a big blue uh, nucleus in there. Now the granules contain numerous chemicals, and the, the chemicals are really what uh, help the eosinophil to uh, do its jobs, and that includes includes uh, recruiting other cells uh, into the area where the eosinophils are working. Uh, it aids them in killing off uh, certain types of organisms. Uh, in particular parasites, uh, and it also contains chemicals that seem to cause allergic type reactions, things like histamine. Uh, here's an actual picture uh, under a microscope of an eosinophil, and there's actually a couple different cells there. The, the little red ra round cells are red blood cells. Uh, the one with the N above it uh, is called a neutrophil, and then the one with the E above it is the eosinophil. Now, normally you have about 500 of these eosinophils or less uh, in a microliter of blood, a millionth of a liter uh, of blood. And uh, when you see higher numbers, uh, that tends to suggest something else going on. It could be allergies or asthma. Uh, it could be some sort of autoimmune disease. It could be a parasite like we talked about. Uh, certain types of malignancies can lead to uh, increased number of eosinophils. And then, of course, the EGIDs, which is what we're here uh, to talk about today. So we know that depending on where you are, where you're looking in the GI tract, the number of eosinophils that you see varies. Uh, the highest number um, tends to be in the uh, duodenum, the first part of the small intestine, where you see on average about 20 uh, eosinophils uh, per high power field. Uh, the, small, the large intestine, or the colon, you see somewhere between 10 and 20 under normal circumstances. Uh, in the stomach, you see about 10 per high-powered field. And what's interesting, particularly to me, is that in the esophagus, you generally don't see any eosinophils. So that's the one area of the GI tract where seeing eosinophils for any reason uh, implies something is going on there, something that's not uh, a normal uh, situation. And when you have a higher than expected number of eosinophils in any of those areas, and you combine that with the presence of GI symptoms of some sort, you have to at least start to suspect that perhaps a, an EGID, an eosinophil gastrointestinal disorder, uh, is present. So. Uh, uh, the EGIDs in general, they, they involve some form of, of GI symptoms typically, and that can be any number of things from vomiting and abdominal pain, diarrhea, reflux symptoms, even GI bleeding or loss of nutrition or, or nutrients and malabsorption. Um, and then you have to combine that with the presence of increased numbers of eosinophils uh, somewhere in the GI tract uh, before you would make a diagnosis of an EGID. Uh, there I'm going to break down the EGIDs into kind of four main categories for the purpose of this talk. There's eosinophil esophagitis that people will call EE or EOE sometimes. Uh, there's eosinophil gastroenteritis, which people will sometimes call EG or sometimes EOG. Eosinophilic colitis, or EC, and eosinophilic proctitis, uh, or EP, which gets talked about a lot less, and I'm just going to talk briefly about that one little aspect as well. Starting with eosinophilic esophagitis, it's characterized by increased eosinophils in the esophagus and really only in the esophagus. Uh, and again, there's no hard and fast rule with how many eosinophils have to be there before you would give somebody the diagnosis, but as a general guideline, people really start thinking about that problem at about 15 in a high-powered field. Some people use 20 as their cutoff. Some people use 24. Um, EE can occur in, in people of all ages. Uh, it does tend to occur more often in boys or, or, or uh, men than uh, girls and women, uh, really by about two and a half uh, 
uh, sometimes up to three to one uh, ratio. So, so about 70% of the patients uh, involved are uh, boys, but we certainly see it in, in girls as well. Um, the, the symptoms vary a little bit by age. Uh, infants and younger kids, so toddlers, uh, tend to have more reflux symptoms and some irritability and, and, and vomiting. As these kids get older, uh, they may uh, complain more often of abdominal pain as a component of that. Might just be that they're able to complain of abdominal pain as they get older as opposed to a, an infant or toddler who may not be able to verbalize it. Uh, they also uh, tend to have ongoing reflux symptoms and vomiting as well. And then as you get into adolescence and then into adulthood, the, the complaint that you hear more often are things like difficulty swallowing, something we call dysphagia, the feeling that something is getting stuck on the way down, or actually sometimes people do have something physically get stuck called a food impaction where uh, it, it doesn't go down and sometimes even needs to be removed uh, endoscopically. Uh, any of these symptoms can occur in any of the age groups, uh, but uh, generally the, uh, as people get older, the, the symptoms that they complain of do change a little bit. So how do you make a diagnosis of, of, of EE or EOE? Well, you, first you have to suspect the disease, and sometimes that's the biggest hurdle because if you have somebody who is really unaware of the disease or, or really isn't familiar with it, that may not be something that's on their radar, so to speak. It may not be something that they're really thinking about. Um, so, you know, a typical case that we might see would be somebody who has uh, a child who has reflux symptoms that are just ongoing, and you put them on medicine that works in the vast majority of, of uh, kids with reflux symptoms, but they continue to have symptoms just as bad or only maybe just slightly better. Uh, and so when, I, when I'm faced with that situation, one of the first things I think about is, all right, well, what else is going on? If this isn't following the course that I expect it to follow, is there something that I, that you know, I haven't considered yet that's going on. And, and EE, of course, for me, comes to mind very early because it's something that I think about every single day. Uh, but, you know, you have to have that suspicion. You have to have, uh, you know, an index uh, of suspicion about the disease in order to make the diagnosis. But then you also need a second step, which is you need to have some sort of confirmation of your suspicions. And uh, the only test that really can confirm eosinophilic esophagitis as a, as a diagnosis is an endoscopy with a biopsy. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned on the slide previous, you need to see uh, an increased number of eosinophils uh, in the esophagus in order to confirm uh, the diagnosis. And when we're doing those biopsies, we're very often biopsying the stomach and the small intestine as well. And that's partially because we want to exclude eosinophilic gastroenteritis or some other cause of eosinophilia uh, because, as I mentioned earlier, eosinophilic esophagitis really affects only the esophagus. You shouldn't find higher numbers of eosinophils in the other parts of the uh, upper GI tract. So what causes EE? Well, you know, it, EE is primarily thought of as an allergic problem. Um, foods seem to be the major uh, allergen that caused the problem, although not exclusively. Uh, and we are learning that there are other environmental a allergens that also seem to play a role. And in some people, uh, other allergens seem to play a bigger role than, uh, uh, than other people. Uh, but if you wanted to characterize the majority of cases, the majority of cases are due to allergies and in particular uh, food allergies. Treatment is really based on uh, trying to either eliminate what is causing the allergic response or using medications to try to blunt the allergic response. So uh, because a majority of people with EE have food allergies, eliminating foods uh, that they react to is, is usually a successful way of uh, treating the problem. Now, the, the problem with that is, is, of course, identifying the right foods uh, and trying to limit it only to the foods that they're uh, reacting to because if somebody who reacts to numerous foods, 15, 10, 20, 30, uh, may not have very much left that they can eat, and then that sometimes requires uh, special formulas and things like that. Uh, steroids work very well for EE, uh, and you can use them in different uh, preparations. You can take something called prednisone or a medicine like prednisone where you take a pill, you swallow it, it gets absorbed into your bloodstream and it works on your immune system uh, throughout your entire uh, body, and that does work very well. Uh, it does usually involve some side effects if you're on it too long, especially at the higher doses, and you do tend to have recurrence of symptoms after a time uh, after you come off of the medications. There are also localized therapies where you can try to get the medicine to work right on the esophagus. So you take preparations of the medication that seem to stick mostly to the esophagus. They don't really get uh, into the bloodstream uh, to cause some of the side effects that uh, the systemic uh, steroids like prednisone can cause. And those also tend to work quite well. They also uh, tend to result in some recurrence of symptoms if you stop the medications.
And then the newest and, and maybe most exciting uh, aspect of treatment that's come out lately are what's called the biologic therapies. Biologic therapies basically pinpoint uh, a part of the immune system and, and try to modify it. And, and one of the ways they do that is with an antibody. So they've created an antibody against something called interleukin-5 or IL-5. And that's basically a, an important messenger that cells in the body use uh, to talk to other cells and, and uh, recruit other eosinophils and tell eosinophils to kind of come and get active uh, in the area. And so if you use an antibody to bind up that interleukin-5, then theoretically you can also reduce the inflammation and the number of eosinophils uh, that are recruited into the uh, tissue. Now let's contrast uh, eosinophil gastroenteritis with eosinophil esophagitis. It's also characterized by increased number of eosinophils in the, in the GI tract, but it can be really anywhere in the GI tract, from the very top to the very bottom. Uh, most commonly it involves the stomach and the first part of the small intestine, but it really can be anywhere. Uh, the difference, one of the differences between this and, and EE is that the, it, there's less definitive uh, numbers in terms of making a diagnosis. So, you know, people like to throw out 15 or 20 eosinophils per high power field for uh, eosinophilic esophagitis. It's much more difficult to do that with EG because there's already going to be a number of eosinophils that are there uh, to begin with. And so, uh, if there's really, really high numbers, it makes it a little bit easier. If there's kind of moderately high numbers, it makes it a little bit more difficult to make that diagnosis. Um, EG can affect all age groups, uh, but it does tend to be much less common of a disease than EE. And just from personal experience, I mean, you know, we will diagnose several people uh, every month with, uh, with EE. It, it, we diagnose maybe one person a year with, with EG in our practice. Symptoms of EG vary a little bit depending on what part of the GI tract is most uh, affected. So if you have disease in your upper GI tract, then it might uh, present very similarly to EE, uh, things like vomiting or abdominal pain. Uh, if it's primarily in the small intestine, it may not cause vomiting. It might cause problems with diarrhea or pro poor growth or malabsorption of nutrients, uh, loss of protein through the gut, things like that. Uh, disease in the colon tends to present more with diarrhea, sometimes blood in the stool. Um, and then uh, depending on what layer of the bowel uh, is affected, symptoms may change as well. So if you have disease that affects mainly the muscular layers as opposed to the surface layers, you're, you may have more symptoms of blockage or obstruction uh, than if it's just involving the surface. And, and sometimes you can have uh, EG that affects all the way through all the surfaces of the bowel and can even cause a, an accumulation of fluid uh, in the abdominal cavity as well. So it, it just changes and, and is different depending on the individual patient and what uh, type of disease they have. Um, diagnosis, a uh, little bit more difficult uh, to make than EE uh, because the symptoms tend to be a little bit more variable. Uh, the symptoms that do cause EG or are associated with EG uh, tend to be a little bit less specific. They can be, they can be caused in a lot of other problems as well. Um, and then sampling uh, the GI tract in all of the areas of the GI tract is difficult. It's very easy to get a biopsy of the esophagus because we can do a, an upper endoscopy. Uh, it's relatively easy to get a biopsy of the you know, stomach and the, and the small intestine with the same uh, procedure. And it's relatively easy to get a biopsy of the uh, large intestine with a colonoscopy. But you have about 15 or 20 feet of residual small intestine between those two uh, areas that you can reach with the colon uh, colonoscopy and the upper endoscopy that's much more difficult to sample. They do make certain types of scopes uh, that can get there, but that's a much more drawn out procedure. Uh, and uh, I'm going to show you another way that you can kind of look at uh, the small bowel as well. Um, the other thing that's important is that, uh, as I mentioned in an earlier slide, eosinophils tend to be present in most places in the GI tract already. So it, it's a little bit more difficult to know whether the uh, eosinophils there are pathologic or abnormal uh, causing disease or are they the normal uh, component of eosinophils that are there to begin with. What causes EG? Well, uh, there's an allergic component to it, uh, but maybe not as much as with EE. Uh, we commonly see other allergic disorders in people with EG, so things like asthma and eczema, uh, allergic rhinitis we see in people who have EG uh, in increased numbers. Um, but we do know that people with EG are less likely to respond to dietary elimination than people with EE. It doesn't mean none of them do, uh, but a, a lower proportion of them do. So that, to me, implies that it's not just strict food allergy or just not strict allergy in general, but that there's kind of multiple factors that come into play, and one of those is probably some problem with the immune system itself, a dysregulation of the, of the immune system itself.
Uh, treatment, in general, I usually recommend trying dietary th uh, therapy first just because if it works, uh, that's uh, certainly a, a, a great uh, uh, advantage in my opinion. Uh, but I also go into it knowing that there's a chance that it, it's not going to work and then there are some backup plans that you have to have in place. Um, steroids do tend to work well with this disorder as well. Uh, sometimes you need to use uh, steroids like prednisone, more systemic steroids because it's hard to get the steroids to stick to the GI tract all the way from the top to the bottom, so you, you don't have that same advantage that you have in EE where it's a, a limited amount of the GI tract that's involved. Uh, there are some other medications, something called gastrochrome, uh, Singulair, which a lot of people are on with for a number of other allergic disorders, may be effective in EG. Uh, those don't tend to work very well with EE. Um, and then there are immune modulating drugs, so drugs that we use for people with all sorts of immune problems, in particular things like Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. Uh, these drugs also may have a role uh, in eosinophil gastro gastroenteritis as well. Um, eosinophil colitis you can think of almost as a just a subset of eosinophil gastroenteritis. It, it's basically EG that involves only the colon. Uh, and the symptoms that you get when you have uh, EC are, are similar to the symptoms that you'd have if you had Crohn's colitis, uh, infectious colitis, like you had an infection with salmonella, uh, or um, uh, ulcerative colitis. So uh, basically it, it, they behave similarly. Um, it's important to try to differentiate this from those causes as well, and, and sometimes we even see increased number of eosinophils with other t causes of colitis. So people who have inflammatory bowel disease, Crohn's disease, or ulcerative colitis may have higher numbers of, of eosinophils in their colon as well. So it sometimes makes it a little more difficult to nail down the diagnosis of one versus the other in the beginning. Uh, treatment, it, it may respond to dietary therapy, and again, I think it's reasonable to give a try of, of dietary therapy for these patients. Uh, you also may be able to uh, get away with what we consider topical therapy for the colon, same type of things we would use for people who have ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease, uh, in particular a product called mesalamine. Uh, it tends to respond very well to steroids, uh, and again, the immune modulators, just like in other forms of eosinophil gastroenteritis, may have a role as well. And then lastly, there's eosinophilic proctitis. Uh, eosinophilic proctitis is, is an allergic problem, uh, and it's usually seen in infants. It usually involves the very most uh, distal portion, the very last portion uh, of the uh, colon called the rectosigmoid region. Uh, it usually is uh, associated with blood and mucus in the stool, diarrhea sometimes, straining sometimes. But it differs from eosinophilic colitis as a whole in that it usually occurs only in infants. Uh, and it usually is caused by food allergy, in particular things that are in their formulas like milk uh, or soy proteins. So in summary, uh, the EGIDs, they, they do share many features, including uh, the important one, which is eosinophilic infiltration of the GI tract. Uh, you need a biopsy to confirm the diagnosis pretty much in any of those. Uh, they, they all have some form of GI symptom associated with them, and they all tend to have at least some allergic component, uh, some more than others. Uh, there are also several important distinctions, and that includes uh, the EE only occurring in the esophagus, uh, EC occurring. Uh, as a subset of EG and eosinophilic proctitis occurring in infants uh, and usually being food allergy uh, related. Uh, the last slide here is just kind of a table just to kind of go over everything that we talked about, some of the similarities uh, and differences uh, between all these dis disorders.